All right, today we're going to go through Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. So I'm, I'm enjoying going through Acts. I think there's a lot of uh, good stories in here, good encouragement. So I'm going to keep going. Acts chapter 9, we read here the introduction of Paul, and we also see Peter doing some miracles near the end there. So what we're starting to see now in Acts, we're starting to see like a pivot here where the gospel now is going to the Gentiles, right? So before, I mean, Jesus had always told the disciples, remember, to go preach the gospel to every creature, Jerusalem, Judea, and all the outermost part of the world. They did it. Persecution happened, kind of spread them out. But still, they weren't really, you know, preaching it to the Gentiles. So, you know, Paul was appointed as the apostle of the Gentiles. He was kind of the vessel God used to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, but he also used Peter as well which we'll see in the next chapter, where we sort of see that pivotal moment happening in Acts. So I've got four sections that I've broken this chapter into that we'll go through and get some lessons and encouragement from it. So the first one is Jesus appears to Paul. Jesus appears to Paul. So we see here Acts chapter 9, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So I think it's interesting that the Bible uses this term here with Saul, breathing out threatenings and slaughter. So not only do you think about it like given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, like God spake these words, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this idea of breathing like these threats that were going out in terms of verbally. But I like how it uses this term breathing because it's almost like it was second nature to Paul. So you could see how zealous Paul was in terms of persecuting these Christians, that it was almost just like part of his, you know, his nature just like the second nature of him just wanting this, you know, this persecution to come on them. So it's giving you this idea that Paul was actually quite zealous in this persecution. He did it ignorantly, but he was very proactive about it. So he wasn't sent to Damascus to try and find Christians. He desired of the chief priest letters. He was proactive to go, I, I'm trying to get this authority because I'm trying to cause trouble for them. It's not just that he was somebody that was one of the ones playing along. So you can see there, when he talks about himself being the chief of sinners and how terrible he was at persecuting the church, it was really something he was very proactive about. It wasn't just something he took part in. Right? So now... We see this in Galatians 1.13, for you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So you can see there, you know, Paul was already somebody that excelled in the things that he did, but unfortunately, he just excelled in ignorance. He was zealous and exceeding, exceedingly zealous, the Bible says, and above measure he persecuted the church of God, but he did it in ignorance. In Romans 10, he talks about his brethren the same way. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, look at this, but not according to knowledge. See, this is what Paul had. Paul had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And sometimes young Christians, immature believers, are the same. The way they deal with persuasion and disagreements and arguments. They have a zeal of God, but it's not always according to knowledge. And you need to, you know, just be wary of that. That, you know, zeal without knowledge can cause a lot of damage. So, you know, sometimes when you're a young believer, you're an immature believer, I was the same as well. You can be very zealous in the things you want to do. But you don't always know what you're doing. So that doesn't mean, that shouldn't discourage you, discourage you from trying to do things, but you just need to be aware of that. And that's why this attitude that sometimes people have is they just say, well, I just tell the truth and it doesn't matter, like, 
you know, what the, what the effects are, shows that it's that zeal that's not according to knowledge because the way you communicate things and the way you do things can have lasting impacts, can have damaging impacts, right? So, like here, Paul was zealous, and obviously he was zealous for false, something false, but sometimes just having a zeal that's not according to knowledge can cause a lot of damage. So we need to take care with that. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So this is when Jesus appears to him. And he mentions it in 1 Corinthians 15, that he was the last apostle that Jesus appeared to, because he was one born out of due time. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So we know that his name was um, Saul before it was Paul. There isn't really a time when he's told your name is now Paul, like with Peter, you know, when he says, you know, your name's Peter, when Jesus said to him. He just starts being called Paul. So we don't really know why his name changed. We just know that it was, his name was Saul before, and then all of a sudden he starts being referred to as Paul, but then he, now he's known as Paul the Apostle, as opposed to Saul the Apostle. So I don't know if, you know, did he change his name or something? Uh, you know, did he change his name because he wanted a different thing? I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that, but he's just referred to as Paul at one point onwards and now known as Paul the Apostle. But prior to that, his name was Saul. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So what is he talking about here, kicking against the pricks? I mean, I know the word prick is used today as a slur, but this is talking about, I believe, the, the pricks in the conscience, right? Like, like, it's like he's knowing, it's like in his conscience he knew and what he was doing was not entirely right, but he was so zealous for God in ignorance that he ignored his conscience, right? And I think that's what it's talking about here. It's like within you there's a bit of a vex, right? And you are ignoring it, but you should know. Um, so it's saying it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's how I've always understood what that's saying. But it's interesting that when the light comes to Paul and the light comes to him, that he immediately recognizes that the light is God. He just doesn't know, you know, who, who is it. So, because if you see here, he says here, he, fell to the, fell to, he's, he says here in verse 5, and he said, who art thou, Lord? So he recognizes that it's God coming to him, but then it's because God is saying, well, you're persecuting me. Remember, he believes that he's serving God. So that's why he's saying, well, who, who, who are you that, that I am persecuting? And then the revelation comes to him, and I'm sure it's very shocking to him because, you know, he, he, he's not, you can see here when he reflects on it in his, his in epistles that he's not doing this out of a hatred for God. He's actually doing these things out of a love for God, right? He's zealous about the things of God, and that's why he's persecuting Christians because he's seeing that as his service to God. So imagine how Paul is feeling when God comes to him in a light and says, the very person you are persecuting out of a love for me is the very one that you should be serving. Right? So that's why this, this moment in Paul's life is obviously uh, is a, is a huge change of heart and, 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 a, and a huge revelation to it. So it reminds me as well of the verses in Revelation. that the, He recognizes that it's the Lord God, but doesn't necessarily recognize that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the same in Revelation. In Revelation, we see here that um, not that somebody's recognizing that it's God, but we recognize here that the Lord God is the Lord Jesus. He says, He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets. So, all throughout Revelations, we refer to the Lord God. The Lord God is sitting on the throne, right? The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So, the angel is saying to John, right? What John is talking about here, the angel that was sent to him, was sent by the Lord God. And then in verse 16, it says here, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So in the same way, Paul recognized that the glory of the light was God. He just didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And not everybody acknowledges as well today that the Lord God is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let's go on. Verse 6, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So it, what's interesting here is, uh, let, let's read on a bit, and then I'll give you some thoughts. And the men which journey, journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So the way I imagine it here, and if you line it up with other passages which we'll talk about when we get on to the later books of Acts, because Paul actually recounts this story twice, is what is actually happening here, it's like the bright light, right? Maybe they see that light as well, you know? They, they sort of see something's going on because they're all kind of speechless of what's happening. They hear a voice, and I imagine that only Saul is understanding what that voice is saying to him, but they're just hearing like maybe the muffled sounds of a voice. Like they know somebody's talking, but they don't know what's being said because later on Paul describes that he's the only one that heard what was actually said as opposed to hearing that a voice was speaking, if that makes sense. It's kind of like when you hear somebody in a room. You can hear people are talking, but you can't make out what they're saying. So that's what's saying, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So they, they didn't see anyone either. And I don't think Saul saw anyone either. He just saw a light, right? was blinded by it. Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, right, so obviously the light he sees, obviously closing his light, eyes, because it's too bright, but then when he opens his eyes, he's blinded, right, he can't see. He saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So I think there's a couple of things going on here. One is, some of the things I want to mention is, You'll notice that when Jesus says to Saul at the time, he says, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And then all he tells Paul to do is arise and go into the city, and then it'll be told what you'll do. So what's interesting is that he didn't tell Paul what he was going to do at that time. He just gave him something to do. Um, and, you know, other people might be wondering, but what plans has he got for me? What's in store in the future? And the point here is like, sometimes that's what the Christian life is like. Sometimes God's word only helps us to take the next step, right? You may not be able to see 10 steps ahead. You know, you may know what you need to do this month, this year, but you may not know what you need to do 10 years from now, right? And it's all right to think about those things, but you need to make sure that you're doing what God wants you to do the next step. See, so it's like maybe Paul was wondering what plans in the future he had for him and Jesus just says to him, arise and go into this city. Now what if Paul didn't do that? What if Paul thought, you know, my plans were to go back, you know, to where I came from and, you know, that's what my plans were. Well, he didn't do that step that God wanted him to do. He may not have known what to do next. So you see, so it's like, a, it's like a video game, right? You know, you want to unlock the next level? Well, you've got to get through this level first. You know, you've got you to do what God expects from you, from what you know to do, before you wonder what God does for you later on in the future. Because who knows where, where God's going to lead you? You know, I mean, I think about my own life. I had, I had no idea what was in store for me 10 years later, 15 years later. You know, and I look at, like, I look back at my life and I, I think about the things and where God has led me in my life and the things that I'm doing. I didn't know that back then when I got saved. And there's been times in my life, you know, where I only knew the next thing to do and, and what I believe was the right thing to do. I mean, me going to America was a, was a good example because back then I was looking for a good church. I couldn't find one. You know, I was, I was trying to find one that believed the things that we're, we learn in this church. But I knew there was a close one that believed those things in America. So I could have just stayed and then, you know, just been in like these you know, lukewarm churches and everything like that. But I, I went there because I, because I knew at the time, you know, I think this is where God wants me to be at this point in my life and I can go there. So I went. And, you know, that's where I met Elizabeth. And then, you know, there's other things. So, you know, maybe that, that wouldn't have happened if I didn't take that step. So, like here with Paul, he was given a task to do. He didn't know what the future held. He just had to obey to do that. And when he did that, 
Then he found out from Ananias, this is what God's plans are for you. But isn't that interesting? That he didn't know, right? He didn't know that until he went to speak to Ananias. And like I was saying in our Christian life, our Christian life is the same. This is why the Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, this is one of our memory verses too, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I often use this verse to explain to you that sometimes, you know, God's word only gives you clarity on the next step to take. But as you take one step, you then get clarity to take the next step and then to take the next step and then to take the next step. And then when you look back, you'll see how God led you. But you may not know where he's leading you 10 steps ago, if that makes sense. So Paul losing his sight, getting a command from God, going into the city blind. This is the physical picture of walking by faith, not by sight, right? He lost his sight. He was told something to do, and now he's going literally blind, not knowing, not even knowing who's leading him. And this is the same idea, like spiritually, where we walk by faith, not by sight, right? And he literally did that. And I wonder if the three days not eating also is a picture of you know, Jesus dying and rising again. You know, Paul is dying, right, in the sense, and then now he's going to get saved and when he goes to talk to Ananias, right? So let's go to the second part. Second part is Ananias gets saved. So some lessons from the first part is, remember, zeal without knowledge can cause a lot of damage. And the second lesson is sometimes you can only know the next step to take, not the next 10 steps. So you've got to walk by faith in God's word, not by sight. Number two, Ananias gets saved, gets Paul saved. So, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, um, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So you can see here God is actually setting up two people to meet. Um, now here, in the early church, he's been more proactive about getting two people to meet. But you can see, even though he's setting them up to meet, giving them visions and telling them what to do, they still had to take the opportunity. So in our life, sometimes it's the same. God can do the same thing in our lives. He can create the opportunity, but that doesn't mean we don't have to take that opportunity. And this is often applied in, in relationships, right? And people are dating, you know. God can create opportunities. He can open and close doors, but that doesn't negate your responsibility to act on it and take that opportunity when it arises, right? So it's the same here. God may be he's setting up this meeting between Ananias and Saul, but they have to be obedient to what is required to do and actually act on it. 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So you see how what Paul is doing, and he's, he's obviously his reputation is preceding him. Um, and here, he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias, so you see how God actually used Ananias to deliver Paul this message of what purpose he had for Paul. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou might receivest thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, when he had eaten, he was strengthened then, Paul, then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. So after he was strengthened, he stayed with the disciples there and we started preaching the gospel, obviously, in, immediately in Damascus. So a couple of things here. So God is commanding Ananias. God is commanding, because remember when God commanded Ananias to go see Paul? Ananias wasn't comfortable with that. Remember he said, man, I've heard about this guy. It's like, are you sure it's this guy you want me to go see? Because this guy, if you remember, is killing people and arresting people. Um, now, if God tells you to do something, I mean, that's the one thing you don't doubt, right? <laughs> like, if, if God comes to you directly and says you do something, 
I mean, surely he knows what he's talking about. But you can see, even though people have God come directly to them, there's still doubts, right? So it's not like, oh, you know, people, they, they doubt God's word, you know, and they say, oh, I'm not really believing God's word. Or they say, well, if Jesus just came to me and told me, you know, then I'd just do it. Well, would you? Well, they, they didn't, you know. Like, God sometimes comes to them, you know, like with Moses, remember? It's like they still have doubts. Because sometimes God, even through his word or directly in some instances like this, gets you to do things that you're not comfortable with. He may get you to do something that goes against your own judgment of the situation. And what you want to learn here from this situation is not everything that is right to do always seems right according to man's wisdom. Right? So that's why sometimes the Bible has things in there for us to do. You know, and a, a good example of it is like how we rear our children. You know, sometimes it doesn't always feel right to spank children and things like that. But then, you know, that's one thing we have to do. Obviously balanced with nurture and all that sort of stuff. And we can try and take the world's wisdom, right, and have all the problems that the world has, or we can take God's wisdom. But there's many other scenarios in the Bible where there's just things that, you know, that you should be doing, right, that isn't always comfortable, it doesn't always feel right, doesn't always align with man's wisdom. That just means it's not the right thing to do. What's another example? Proactive soul winning. Because what does the world say? The world might say, eh, people want that information and they'll get it themselves. Oh, you know, I don't think we should go into people's personal spaces and you know, disrupt them. You know, I don't want to be like, you know, offensive. I don't think it's us for it to be offensive. Is that God's wisdom or is that man's wisdom? Right? Because man, man's wisdom says, hey, maybe it doesn't feel right. Maybe it's offensive. Maybe it's this. God's wisdom is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? So there are things that God gets us to do that isn't always right. It isn't always, doesn't always feel right to man. So some people might say, I don't have a good feeling about this. Hey, Ananias didn't have a good feeling about it. But was it the right thing to do? Here's how, here's how it rears its head in, in Christianity. Right? This is, this is how people get, it, get it around doing something clearly that like God wants them to do is they'll say, I don't have peace about it. I don't have peace about it. How many times have you heard somebody say that? They're like, oh, I should do it. But I don't have peace about it. I mean, is, is peace, is your peace about it the final arbiter of truth, of whether it's true to do or not? No, it's whether it's right. You may not always have peace about what's right to do. Ananias didn't have peace about it, but was it right to do? It was right to do. Here's a scenario in Matthew 8 where the disciples didn't have peace, but they were right with Jesus. Here's in Matthew 8. When he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he, Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. So this is a good physical example of the disciples being in a very unpeaceful situation. But were they in the will of God? They were right with Jesus. Jesus was with them in the boat. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So my point is here, just you don't always judge the right thing to do based on whether you have peace. Because sometimes the right thing to do does not necessarily give you peace, like Ananias. And sometimes, like in Matthew 8, you can be right in the boat with Jesus, right, and not have peace. And yet that's where you're meant to be. All right, so keep that in mind. Don't, don't come into this whole, uh, this idea of like, I don't have peace about it. You know, that's, you know, you should have peace when it aligns with God's word. Not peace just because you don't feel any conflict within you about it because sometimes the right thing to do may cause some internal conflict. Now, it's okay to questions. It's okay to have questions. And it's normal to have doubts. You don't have to feel that you're not normal to doubt. I mean, Ananias doubted, Moses doubted, Gideon doubted. So great men of God have, have had doubts. And it's okay to have questions. But like I'm saying, we should strive to have faith to follow God's word regardless of how we may feel about doing what is right. Now, the last thing I want to say here is some people believe that Paul was saved when Jesus appeared to him. Right? And 
Oftentimes, Paul is used as an example of work salvation. They say, like, see, when you get saved, you know, there's going to be this great change in your life, and you don't have this change, maybe you're not saved. And they say, look at Paul, you know, when he faced Jesus, you know, he was killing Christians, and then, oh, he just he changed, and he's a new man, and just all different. And they say, like, that's the salvation experience. And am I saying that that's not a powerful testimony? That could be a powerful testimony to help persuade others to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everyone has that testimony. Not everyone has that great change because that great change is not necessarily required for salvation. What's required is a change of your beliefs to believe on Jesus Christ. But Paul is often used as that example. Now, I don't believe Paul got saved at that point, right? Because what happens later? What happens later is he's just told to go talk to Ananias, right? And Ananias comes to him, and he recounts when Ananias comes to him in Acts 22. One Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me. This is Paul recounting as he, as he went to Damascus. Came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. Do you see? So I think the meeting of God represents kind of like his, his death and making him realize that he's blind, right? But what makes him see is when he goes to Damascus and he believes on Jesus Christ, right? So the, that's, I think, the right picture, that he realizes, so when you're faced with God and you're faced with God's law, you may realize your spiritual blindness. But then when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is when you receive that sight, Right? So he's saying here, came unto me and said, and said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him. So this is where I believe Paul gets saved, when his sight returns to him. Right? And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. So now that he's saved, now he's given his, his purpose. Right? But thou shalt be his witness unto all men, of all what thou hast seen and heard. And not now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So some people try and use this verse to say that the baptism is washing away the sins. But we would say, no, it's the calling on the name of the Lord that is washing away the sins. Right? So he receives his sight, which is a picture of salvation, but it's not, obviously it's not until he calls on the name of the Lord that he's saved. So this is now Ananias talking here, right? So he calls on the name of the Lord, he's saved, and then the baptism represents that salvation. Right? So, I don't believe Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. I believe he was saved when he came preaching of Adonis, like we see in Romans 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? God uses men to deliver the gospel to other men, and that's how they got saved. So, the lesson from this section is the right thing to do isn't always what feels right, gives you peace, you want to be led by God's word and not your emotions. Now let's look at Paul's ministry, because now his ministry begins. Acts 9.20 And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So what's important to note here is, see look, Paul immediately begins to preach the gospel right after getting saved. Right? And this is a good example for believers to follow, because often people have this mindset that soul winning uh, isn't something that you do immediately. It's something that you wait to do, right? And soul winning is saying, oh, you know, when I've learned a bit more and things like I get ready, no, you come along as a side by you. Immediately should be getting involved in evangelism as a believer, just like Paul. He gets saved, he gets baptized, the Bible says here, and straightway he preached Christ into the synagogues that he is the son of God. He didn't say, well, I'm going to wait until like the, you know, the whole thing about like me killing Christians and me, uh, you know, putting them in jail. I'm just going to wait until that blows over a bit. Um, and then I'm going to go out and preach the gospel. No, he went straight in with everyone knowing what his past was. So, you know, yes, you know, objections can be complex with soul winning, but the message itself is simple. I mean, think about it. Like, you know how you got saved. I mean, Soul winning is just you sharing what you know about how you got saved. So it's not that you don't know how to get saved, right? It's just about telling others about how you got saved. So Because you've got to understand how to get saved if you got saved. So you know all you need to know to start telling others how to get saved because that's what you needed to know to get saved. 
Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? So it wasn't just Ananias knew. I mean, this was well known, obviously, throughout all of them because he wanted to kill them all and, and bind them that he was, um, you know, persecuting the church of God. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, you know, you have a lot of examples in the Bible of people that you can draw encouragement on. You know, you have Job going through suffering and knowing the reasons why. You have Solomon saying he's got all the riches and all the wealth and all the wisdom, and yet... The end of the matter was to fear God and keep his commandments. And this is the whole conclusion of the matter. What's Paul's example? I mean, Paul is the ultimate example in the Bible of not letting the things you've done in the past stop you from doing great things for God. Because, right? I mean, if, if somebody's got a past that would stop him from doing great things for God, it's doing the exact opposite of doing great things for God, which is killing and imprisoning people that were trying to do great things for God. So isn't Paul, Paul's the perfect example of when you feel that you've been written off, right? That God can't use you anymore. I mean, how can God use me when I've done X, Y, Z? Well, how could God use Paul when Paul had done X, Y, Z? Because he's the example that, you know, if you're saved, God's not done with you. You know, you can still do great things for God no matter what you've done in the past, just like Paul. And even though he's got this reputation in Damascus, he's still increasing the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So Paul had this realization. He knew what he had done and he knew the situation he was in. But you see, it didn't let it stop him. And it wasn't, when you look at Paul's reasoning, it wasn't because, oh well, because he was just like determined you know, and he just believed in himself, you know, and things like that. Look at what he says. He says, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, then I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he knew he didn't deserve his office. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So he's not saying that, you know, God, like God gave me this and it wasn't in... He is in a sense, but what he's saying here, what, what I think he means by this is, see, he didn't want the grace that was given to him by God to be in vain, Right? to say, look, he was, given, he was given an opportunity to serve God and was you know, you know, given salvation, but yet if he didn't labor abundantly, that would have been given to him in vain, meaning it wouldn't have profited anyone else except him. So his motivation was, look, God has given me this chance, given me this grace, and if he doesn't labor, then it would be given to him in vain. And it kind of lines up with James 2, which is often used inappropriately with salvation. But the idea is here, it says, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. You see, O vain man, because if you don't add works to your faith, it's not profitable to others. So Paul labored abundantly because he knew that this grace that was given to him would be in vain if he didn't use, go out and use it to, for God's glory. So Paul understood that what he had done he, deserved, he, he understood that he did not deserve to be an apostle, but he did not want the grace given to him by God to be given to him, to be given in vain, right? According to others, right? Not just to himself, not to himself. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him, but they laying away it was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down um, by the wall in a basket. So what I want to say here is, look, see, so your actions can regain the trust of people you have hurt or wronged. You see here, you can see here that, you know, did, did they owe Paul a, a forgiveness? 
No, right? They didn't owe Paul forgiveness, and he's trying to arrest them, trying to kill them. But what, what it's showing here is, is that if somebody does repent of their sins, right, and, and they try to actually do right from then onwards, that there is a pathway back to reconciliation and forgiveness. And we should offer that. You know, we, sh we should be open to that. Right? So there's, that, there's this two-way here where, yes, are they justified in wondering whether he's had a true change of heart? But see, it gets to the point where you, know, you can sort of see from people's actions that, they, they, that they're more genuine in their love for God and you couldn't, shouldn't keep holding it against them. Right? So, so here, this is a good picture like, of conflict. You know, that people need to be given grace. So not only is, you know, somebody who's done wrong should strive to make it up for the person that they wronged, right, and show that they're genuine in that, but also, you know, what if the, what if the believers in Damascus didn't, didn't give him that opportunity, right? But, but we as, as Christians, if people want forgiveness, we should be willing to offer it to them. Right? Because, you know, some people have the attitude in conflict, in relationships, and they'll say things like, it doesn't matter what they do, how hard they try, like, I will never trust them again, I will never forgive them. And my point is, is that right? Is, is it right to burn a bridge and not give somebody the opportunity to try and earn the trust back? And I think that's wrong, right? It's not saying that you should, you should, they should give it without deserving, right? But I'm saying that a conflict must be resolved by two people, right? So one person has to try and right the wrong that they did, but if the other person burns the bridge and says, no, it doesn't matter what they do, I will never forgive them, that is also wrong, right? And what does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches us that we, if somebody comes and asks for forgiveness, that you have to forgive them. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, right, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. In Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus, said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him, till seven times. So he's referring back to that lesson, till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times times seven. So this is like talking about in a day. So he's effectively taking off the limits, right? And saying we should be people of forgiveness if people are coming back and trying to repent and trying to make right. We should not be holding it over them. Like they've done wrong and it's like, oh, you'll never get back right in my books. You know, and that, that is wrong, right? We should be given the opportunity to come back. And look, Paul was given the opportunity to come back with the people of Damascus, right? And it doesn't mean that they don't need to prove themselves or they, that they should trust them straight away, but you need to be open to allowing a path to reconciliation. When Paul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So you see that Paul is having this trouble everywhere he's going. He had it with an Ananias, right? Does that stop him? You know, does Paul just go like, oh, look, I've done so much, and they just don't accept me, right? He's got to realize that the wrong that he's done, that he's got to make up for it, right? So... Not only is he getting it from the disciples in Damascus, he's getting it also from the disciples in Jerusalem. But, look here, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So, I think we see here, like it was very gracious of Barnabas to basically give Paul credit for his works, give him a reference. Right? So this idea of speaking up on behalf of somebody is also a way you can show grace to somebody that you feel is genuine in their repentance of doing something wrong. So Barnabas here speaks on behalf of Paul, brings him to the apostles and say, no, 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 like I can testify that you know, he risked his life and we had to let him down the wall out of a basket and he's preaching God, he's preaching the right things, I think you should accept him. So you know, I think this is you know, very gracious of Barnabas here to, to do that for Paul. You know, and, and, and basically testify on Paul's behalf to the uh, apostles and disciples at Jerusalem. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Right? So this idea of Barnabas 
speaking on behalf of Paul, reminds me of this verse in Proverbs 27 too. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. So when you're trying to make up for what you've done, like your actions tend to speak louder than words. Right? So you see Paul's actions, and then somebody else beseeched somebody on their behalf to say, look, you know, I've seen what he's done. Um, I think we, we can see that he is genuine in his service for God. Um, uh, Acts 9.31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Now, what I find, what I find interesting here is you notice that like Paul is, has not only been removed from persecuting the church, but now his, his uh, you know, preaching of the gospel, making people think, you know, the, the, this, this passage about Paul ends on all the churches in Judea and Galilee and Samaria were edified and they had rest. Rest from what? Rest from the persecution. So there was some reprieve of the persecution, which just goes to show how much trouble one person can cause, right? Like, this is how much trouble one person can cause all these churches, right? Their proactiveness in, you know, coming after them. And that can happen, you know, in government. That can happen in churches as well. One person can cause a lot of trouble and can cause, create a lot of peace, right? So this is why Proverbs 22, 10 says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. So, hey, we've got to be careful as well, you know, with, with our own circles, you know. So some lessons from this section is don't let your past stop you from doing great things for God. You know, don't wait to start serving God. The right time to serve God is now. And number two from here is be gracious. Give people a second chance. They prove themselves to be genuine by their actions. Don't be unforgiving. And we'll spend a bit of time on this last section. This is the last section now turns to Peter. Right? And Peter, we see a couple of miracles from Peter. The first miracle says, It came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. So he's in Lydda, right? There's somebody who's sick at eight years, just basically like laying, right? Or he's sick. And he heals him. You can arise, make thy bed. Eight years. We'll go on to the next one and I'll give you some thoughts. Next one is, now there was, a, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Now, that, that word, that name Dorcas, not so good in English, but I, I remember when I first, just tell you a funny story, I, I remember first meeting uh, a woman who was called Dorcas, and it's one of those names where it takes you a bit of back when you don't realise it's a biblical name. And I felt a bit rude at the time because I was, she introduced herself and I was like, like Dorcas, that's your, that's your name? But, you know, so people sometimes name their daughters Tabitha and Dorcas. It might be a good recommendation in English, you know, to use the Tabitha version of this lady rather than Dorcas. But, you know, this, this lady was named Dorcas, but he, she also had a name, Tabitha. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. So I think partly the reason why we're told about these miracles that Peter has done is it's showing how he progressed from one town to the other. Because he went to Lydda, right? and at Lydda he healed somebody, and the people in Joppa heard about him, who knew Tabitha, Dorcas, right? And then that's how he got to Joppa. And then if you know Acts 10, which we'll be looking at soon, Acts 10 in Joppa is when Cornelius comes to Peter. And that's what I'm saying. It's this shift to going to the Gentiles. But we're, seeing, this is just, we're just seeing Peter's travels and how he got there as well and the things he's doing along the way. And not delayed to come to them. But then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber and all the windows, widows, 
stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. So you can see here that Dorcas was a lady very appreciated in her community and that she had done a lot of good to the people there. I mean, I'm sure back then, you know, it wasn't just when you provide clothes for somebody, it's not just, you know, you go to Kmart and buy a couple of clothes and then, you know, help them out. You know, they, they're making them, you know, making clothes. Imagine having to make clothing, make fabric. And, I mean, it's, she's, she's, she's doing a lot of good for these people. I mean, she's not famous, she's not well-known around all the place, but the people she was around really loved her. She had impacted these people there. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. So remember, Tabitha had already died, right? Now they're calling Peter and he says to her, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and lifted her up and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, why is this a critical point? So a couple of things is, first of all, one thing I think we can take from this section of the chapter is we can see that God's grace is both for the disabled and the diligent. Because what I got from this passage when I was looking at it, I thought, you know, that guy that was on his bed eight years surely just thought, like, God's forgotten about me. And he's eight years, and he's just like, you know, he can't do anything, he's lame. But then, yet, God came for him, you know, and Peter came and healed him. Like, why, why, would, Peter, like, why would it be just specifically in Acts saying, like, well, there's this guy of eight years, you know? Well, one thought I had was, you know, God gets the lowly, but then also... Um, him bringing Tabitha back from the dead also shows that God commends those that are diligent too. Because it wasn't that, it wasn't that Tabitha was like well known, but you can see that she was very commended amongst her community. And, you know, I see that as, you know, sometimes people are not like Tabitha. They're so focused on impacting people that they don't know like with the onset of online and the internet and social media and TikTok and all that sort of stuff. People are so cared about impacting people that they've never met and getting the likes and the comments and things like that, and yet they ignore the people that are actually in their life physically. And this is not Tabitha, right? Tabitha impacted the lives of those around her, and she was really appreciated by the people that she actually knew. But she may not have been known you know, like very famous, that's what I'm saying. So what I take from Tabitha's story is that God came and actually brought her back to life, you know, not just healed her. Now, why, how does this play into the greater story, the greater story of what's going on here? Because bringing somebody back from the dead is no small feat, right? Like there's miracles done through the Bible and people had supernatural powers and healings and things like that. But bringing somebody back from the dead is not too common, right? And not many people did it. So I think what's happening here is that that huge miracle of Tabitha being raised from the dead by Peter is what brings the word to, you know, kind of like people, you know, starting to know. So it's starting to get more out there, right? Because this, this is like a climax of a miracle. Just like when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. That's kind of like the climax in, in John, where you know, he's really, people are starting to realize that you know, this is somebody who's not just doing miracles, but has the power to bring people back from the dead. So it doesn't, doesn't have, there's not that many instances in the Bible of people coming back from the dead. I'll just go through them quickly. One is Elijah. He brought the widow's son back from the dead. Then you had Elisha. So you had Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. They were the only two that brought people back from the dead. Elisha has... There's a similar story to Elijah, where it was like a Shunammite woman's son. So Elijah was lodging with somebody, and then the widow had a son. He died, and he brought him back to, brought him, brought him back to life. Then the Shunammite woman was the story where Elisha was saying, he said, you're going to have a child. She then has the child. She's barren. But then the child gets sick and dies, and, and then she's like saying, you just gave me the child so they didn't lose him, and then he brings him back from the dead. That's the Shunammite son. The other story that's very funny, which is just two passages in the Bible, two, two passages, is 
Elisha's bones actually resurrecting somebody. So if you find that story in the Bible, what's happening is there's actually a funeral going on and the people have to bury this body. But then the Moabites are like coming in and raiding the town, right? Like pirates. So, so the Moabites come in and they're like, quick, you know, we've got to get out of here, hide the body. So they throw the body into the tomb of Elisha, right? And then the body touches Elisha's bones and then the guy gets resurrected. Right? So that's the, that's the third resurrection. The other resurrections are done by Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, you know, there was one where there was a funeral procession going on. The, 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 the widow's son of the, in Nain, and he actually heals, um, brings him back to life during the funeral. Then there's Jairus' daughter, who was one of the, sort of the, I think the centurions, uh, whose daughter was sick and she dies, and then he comes and heals her. Then we know Lazarus. Lazarus, you know, he, he didn't come. And what's inter- interesting with Lazarus is because people, I don't think people die in Jesus' presence. So I think that's why when Lazarus was sick, he waited. Lazarus died. Then he came to bring Lazarus back from the dead to make this point about the resurrection, right? Another to do with Jesus is when Jesus was actually, actually died on the cross. You remember, all the, there's a lot of saints came out of the graves. Like, some people miss that in Matthew. But, and this is why, I don't know why they didn't realize when they crucified Jesus, they crucified the Son of God. When he dies on the cross and people are literally resurrecting out of their graves and, and walking around the city, people that have died, and, and this, is, this is all a picture of you know, the, the resurrection, that Jesus brings life, and when he dies, it, it brings forth other life. So it's all that. And the other two is Peter here with Tabitha. And then the last one is Eutychus. Remember, Eutychus was half in, half out, sitting on the window. He falls asleep, falls out of the window. He dies, and then Paul goes and brings him back to life. So that's Paul. So you can see here in the New Testament, besides Jesus and Elisha, right, and Elijah, you have the head apostle, Peter, bringing somebody back to life, and then you have the apostle to the Gentiles. So it's, this is no small thing here, bringing somebody back to life. I mean, that, it's not that every, it's not this, this doesn't happen all the time, right? So this is setting up the meeting between Peter and Cornelius in the next chapter. So what are some lessons here? I think that God sees both the small and the great. Don't think you're not important enough to God, or to be used by God. And the second lesson, I think, in this section is, you know, God sees our works. You know, try to impact those around you before you try to impact people you've never met online. Okay, so just going over those again. Zeal without knowledge can cause a lot of damage. Sometimes you can only know the next step to take, not the next ten steps. So walk by faith, not by sight. The right thing to do isn't always what feels right. It gives you peace. Make sure you're led by God's word and not your emotions. Don't let your past stop you from doing great things for God, like Paul. Don't wait to start serving God. The right time to serve God is now. You know, be gracious. Give people a second chance if they prove themselves to be genuine by their actions. Don't be unforgiving. And then God sees both the small and the great. Don't think you're not important enough to God or to be used by God. And lastly, God sees our works. Try to impact those around you before you try to impact people you've never met online. All right, so I hope you got some stuff out of that chapter and you implement some of those things in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word and thank you for the stories and acts. So much encouragement we can get from them. I pray, Lord, that your word is an encouragement and an exhortation to the people here today. Uh, We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.